that we have with us uh, Professor Barents from Niemegen in Holland. Many of you know Professor Barents, who's most probably the, the European leader in prostate MRI and, and probably uh, worldwide, I would say. I, I have been following his works and I'm always very impressed. So, Professor Barents, uh, it's for you to go on now and show us a bit more on prostate MRI. Thank you. Thank you for these kind words. It's very nice to hear from a PET CT man that he says, well, MRI is, is, is good and this is perhaps okay. So, my talk will be about innovation, new things, validation, and specifically the organizers ask me to talk about implementation, how to get this technique into clinical practice. So let's first start. What are, do, what are we talking about? We are not talking about endorectal coil imaging. We are not talking about spectroscopy. I put that on purpose on brackets. We talk about multiparametric MRI, a good, fast and simple technique, which consists of anatomy and functional techniques. Let's start with anatomy. Here you see the prostate on the coronal view, axial view, with benign prosthetic hyperplasia, and if you carefully look, you can see a very small tumor. High resolution images. However, that dark spot can also be something else, like fibrosis or prostatitis. So we have more techniques. The first functional technique and the most important functional technique in oncology is diffusion weighted imaging. We are actually looking at the motion of water molecules and we can measure them, we can quantify it. If you have tissue with a lot of space in between the cells, the motion is very high. However, if you have tightly packed cells, there is restriction of the motion, which is the cause predominantly in Gleason 4 and 5 tumors. And on the image, the so-called apparent diffusion coefficient map, ADC map, the color is black, and the value is below 950 to 900. This is a very nice technique to show where a tumor is, and as you will see later, it shows specificity about aggression. So it's a very highly specific technique. Its sensitivity is a little bit lower. You can see that the resolution could be better. The technique which brings specific, uh, sensitivity is contrast-enhanced MRI. You give contrast, and in areas where there is an increased vascular permeability, like a tumor, there is a red area. However, also benign prosthetic hyperplasia and inflammation do show increased enhancement. So this technique, although very sensitive, is not specific. However, if there is no enhancement at all, the negative predictive value of excluding tumor is very high. So if you use the combination of anatomy, diffusion-weighted imaging, and contrast MRI, that may solve a lot of problems. Let's now consider first, review a little bit the limitation of truss biopsy. Significant cancers are missed, anteriorly located. Some tumors insignificant are detected by chance. And finally, the needle doesn't always sample the most aggressive part of the tumor significant undergrading. Now, why multiparametric MRI? This is a paper in the European Urology last year by four urologists and three radiologists. It is a review of the literature of the past two years, and the conclusion is that multiparametric MRI is the most sensitive and specific technique available for imaging prostate cancer. So what are the facts, what are the data which have recently been shown? Multiparametric MRI predicts tumor regression. Multiparametric MRI predicts low versus intermediate to high grade correctly, so it separates the bad guys from the good guys in 95%, and trust does this only in 45, um, 54%. And after one negative trust biopsy, MR guided biopsy, hitting the needle at the most dark place on the ADC, is positive in 41%, with 87% percent 
significant cancers. And furthermore, recently standardization guidelines are being published and will be implemented by the American College of Radiology this year, a European-US approach. So this is the first paper. I will come to that a little later on radiology, relation between diffusion and tumor aggressivity. This is the second paper showing the um, value of MR imaging versus thrust biopsy in uh, 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 comparing a prostatectomy. This is the paper on the MR-guided biopsy itself in negative thrust biopsies, and these are the guidelines. Two in radiology journals and two in European urology. So let's start with first, the, the first paper in radiology. There is a correlation between tumor aggression. This is normal. This is low, intermediate, and high grade, so at least in six, seven, and higher. And you can see that there is a correlation between the diffusion, the restriction of water, and the aggression. And what's even nice is that you can draw a line. There is some overlap, but if you draw a line of around 1,000, it varies a little bit from system to system, but around 1,000 to 900, 800, if you have a value which is below 900, you can be pretty sure that this is an aggressive tumor. It's not only a single report, but it has been confirmed by many other authors. Unfortunately, not one big multi-center trial, but multiple single-center trials, with most of it prostatectomy as gold standard. This is how it looks at the image. If it is hardly visible, it's at least in 3 plus 3. If it's dark gray, there's a four component, and if it's black, it is really a bad tumor. Life for radiologists is simple. <laughs> this is the paper of Hambrock, European Urology, and if you compare the highest Gleason grade in the tumor 3 versus 4 to 5, you can see that with MRI there is an underestimation in 5%, with thrust it's 44%. And if you look at the various components, you can see that the underestimation of thrust with the high Gleason 5 component is significant. It is about uh, the underestimation 70% and MRI is a lot better. We took two cohorts of patients which were comparable, so they were matched, and we took prostatectomy with uh, whole mount section, meticulous histopathologic mapping, mapping every uh, Gleason grade separately as golden standard. Now this is the other paper which uh, is also appeared in European urology. We have been evaluating patients who were referred to us with one negative thrust biopsy and elevated PSA and we saw a detection rate of 41%. You can see that it is the number of patients which we included is quite large. Almost 90% being significant. Only two cores, not 12, but two. And never believe a guy who's presenting his own data. You can see that there are also other authors on MR-guided biopsy which have about a similar yield from 59 to 37%. Detection yields after at least, well, one negative thrust biopsy. An example, patient 62, his life started with a PSA of 8 in 2003, is now 28 and we are living in 2012. He had altogether 96 cores. And this is the MRI you see. This is, by the way, a normal MRI. The blue area is benign prosthetic hyperplasia, so there are two dark areas left. This area and that area, and the question is, what is what? Now let's look at the white area first. We can draw a 1.7 centimeter line, which is the length of a side fire, so actually this is what happened. Due to all those needles, fibrosis has occurred in the peripheral zone of the prostate, making the zone slightly lower in signal. However, the bad guy is over here, with perhaps even some extra capsular disease. This was, first of all, confirmed by the ADC, the diffusion and enhancement, pathologic enhancement, pathologic diffusion. And we finally proved that this patient had a Gleason uh, significant cancer. I think it was 4 plus 3 by MR-guided biopsy. The patient is prone. You put in a needle guide, which has the size of a pen. You direct this towards the tumor. This is the area which has usually been sampled by thrust biopsy. However, with MRI, you can directly hit this tumor anteriorly with one needle. It was a Gleason 4 plus 3. 
Now, the question is, should we biopsy all the patients with MR guidance? I can't answer the question. At this moment, we are doing 16 MR-guided biopsies every week, so about 800 per year. The average time is about 35 to 40 minutes, which will go down to new, due to new technology. But the question is, should we do that, or should we give you the CD-ROM where the tumor is, and merge, for example, here, this is MRI, and now it moves to its ultrasound, so that you will be able to see the most aggressive parts and then hit it with a needle. So this is the most likely way to go for. However, no technique has an automatic segmentation, a contouring of the prostate on MR and ultrasound. They are all rigid, so elastic deformation real time is not possible. So what you really want is a technique which modifies the MR image during your biopsy procedure. Otherwise, you will get a misregistration, which will be at least two millimeters. And if you want to hit small tumors, I think this is not optimal yet. Work in progress. Now, Axel Heidenreich made a comment on the Dickerson paper <coughs> one year ago, and he said MRI is not ready for routine use. Is he right? Well, yes and no. Very recently, we have been working on, for three years, on uh, the guidelines of prostate cancer, and we published this paper a few weeks ago. The acquisition protocols and also how to look at the images is now standardized. We defined minimal criteria. If your radiologist does not fulfill his criteria, he will get bad grades. He is not really performing as he should. So the minimal guidelines are there. First of all, an MRI should not take too long. We have protocols for detection. So where is the tumor? How aggressive is it? Where is it located? For staging, is there extra capsular disease? And finally, information about node and bone. Three simple protocols. Only this protocol has, if you want it, an endorectal coil, which takes about 15 minutes more. The others do not. This time is, is about the average time of an MR examination, which makes this really suitable for daily practice. Well, the other thing is, if you ask the radiologist to look at an image, then he looks at it differently than his neighbor. If you have 10 radiologists, you can have a nice discussion on how an image it looks like. So you need to structure the way of looking of radiologists. And actually what we have been uh, developing is the so-called PIRATS classification. We already have for breast the BIRATS classification and for liver the LIRATS classification. Now we are working on the finalization of the PIRATS, which gives you the probability of the presence of a significant cancer on a detection MRI from one to five. One is normal, five is abnormal, three is equivocal. And this is how it looks. Every modality is scored on a five-point scale. Finally, you have an overall score, and you have a score of the radiologist, his interpretation. This area is, yes or no, a significant cancer. And as a radiologist, we have been working in our group already for a few years with this system, and what we see is that you actually can see differences in how I and my colleague are looking at images and how I sometimes on Monday I'm looking different to images on a Friday. So the, the thing is this quantifies what you're doing and really nails it down to is there an abnormality, yes or no. This is how it looks like. This is for radiologists and for courses, so I will skip it. I will just show a few images. The T2 weighted image is gray, but there's no focal area. Two points. The enhancement is a curve type 2, not decreasing too much, it's not focal, also two points. Diffusion didn't show any abnormalities, so this is a PIRATS 2. Despite the fact that you see bilateral enhancement, this very nicely suits prostatitis. This is a lesion which is anteriorly located. It has an erased charcoal, black and white on diffusion, pathologic enhancement, it gets five points. This for surely is an aggressive, aggressive anterior tumor. This tumor is a little bit more subtle. If I put some circles around it, you can see that something going on over there, black and white, also Pirates 5 at this area. Confirmed by histopathology, a Gleason 4 plus 3 anteriorly located small tumor. Then the question is, can we do it? Or is it only for Nijmegen and some other centers of excellence? The answer is yes, we scan. I got these images from my 
colleague in the middle of the desert, John Feller. He's a little bit crazy about prostate MR, but he has a 1.5 Tesla machine, no endorecal coil, and he just went to some courses, he practiced, he had feedback of his urologist, and he's doing a very good job. You can see a small tumor here, positive on DCE, black and white. This was a very tiny, small, you can see how small it was, Gleason 7 tumor. 1.5 Tesla, no endorectal coil. This is something which I tell my radiologist. How can you be a good prostate MR radiologist? What do you need to learn? What do you need to know? First of all, quality. Good quality, high quality acquisition, high quality reading. There are now rules. Those rules are important, but the next step is to enforce the rules. Second, he needs to know what you need to know. Communication with him. He can tell you all kinds of things about spectroscopy. If, you don't, if, you don't, if you're not interested, if it doesn't help the patient, why should he do it? And he needs to know how to solve the problems. He needs also to know the new techniques, go to literature courses, and how those new techniques can help to solve the problem which we have. Finally, a radiologist needs to know his performance, his limitations, and this needs multidisciplinary communication. If you work with your radiologist, give him feedback. You did a good job or you did a terrible job. Uh, he needs to know. That's feedback. And if he doesn't listen to you, go to his neighbor. One and one is three. It's teamwork. Actually, I always tell the story, I don't care who's who. This is probably the radiologist, the urologist. This is the radiation oncologist. And where's the medical oncologist? <laughs> Behind the cake, that's the mouse. He's pushing the cake in the hands of the cat. Structured report, we need to communicate in the way you like it. Our urologist said, yeah, that is very nice, those key images, but we don't, well, we don't understand them. Please give me those schemes, tables, description, and also clinical data. If you have this, this is very powerful also for research. What do we need more? Availability. I don't have enough MR machines in my institution. We need you as referring physicians. Fight your orthopedic surgeons. Why should we make MR images of the knee and the ankle of the wrist? Doesn't help the patient that much. At least doesn't save his life. We need MRI to save prostate cancer patient's life. So push together with the radiologist, together. So availability is you. I think we need to start with the top centers in the countries. And we have various top centers in the various countries of, of Europe. They are there. If you don't know where they are in your country, please ask me. I can tell you where they are. I think education implementation should start from these centers. Education, certification, also a political issue. But on the other hand, just start. Start to give certificates by the ESUR, for example, or by the American College of Radiology. If you don't fulfill the requirements, whoop, you're not allowed to do prostate MR. At least you're not reimbursed. And of course, a radiologist doesn't like that. Quality control. Quality control in the medical environment is important, but it is a problem. How do you know that your radiologist is doing a good job? How does the patient know? Sometimes I'm seeing images from my colleagues which are not so good. So feedback. And the reference centers need to take care. In soccer, you have the yellow cards and the red cards. If you perform bad, give a yellow card, two yellow cards, you get a red card, and you're not allowed to do prostate MR. We should be as tough as that. Communicate, communicate which, in between the centers. We have powerful tools like internet, like Skype, iPad, FaceTalk. We can use that to help our colleagues. We can look together at images at both sides of the oceans. I think we are underusing this way of spreading the knowledge of reference centers around. Political awareness. Even if you're a radiologist and if you push a little, you, you will see this man listening very nicely to you. He's too young to have prostate cancer, our prime minister, and the queen also is listening to those guys. I'm a little bit shy over there, but okay. Um, patient awareness. I most often get patients now referred to me, they say, uh, referred by urologists, and the urologists say, yeah, please make an MRI, Professor Barnes, but not because otherwise the patient doesn't come to me. Uh, it is important. 
but we should give them appropriate information. And of course, we need to validate the th things we are doing in multi-center trials. What's the future? I think it doesn't matter whether you're a uroradiologist or a radiourologist. We need to work together. I don't care who's sticking in the needle. I even don't care who's making the diagnosis as long as you do it good. Okay, what are the future things? Screening will be enabled by PSA plus MRI before trust biopsy. Statement one. We will, with MRI, improve biopsy yield and decrease number of calls. MRI will help to direct surgery, robotic surgery. It will tell you where you can expect extracapsular disease. It will tell you where the tumor is close to the neurovascular bundle and intensity modulated focused radiotherapy. It will help enable MR guided focal therapy, laser cryo hyphal. And again, I don't care who's sticking in the needle or doing this. It may be the urologist, maybe the radiologist, maybe the radiation oncologist. And finally, we will soon have, again, the iron oxide particles for nodes on the market. It is not a question if to screen, but how and when. Well, how? I think MRI is the tracer we're looking for. The evidence is there. However, we need to validate now in the patient population that MRI is the way to go for. Fortunately, Mike, Mark Emerton is starting a trial. We are starting a trial right here. And we work in Australia and the US also to start trials to prove indeed that this is the right way to go for. The negative predictive value of MRI initial reports is high. Mark Emerton, Geert Verliers, Belgium, Arno Villers in France, a urologist. You can see the negative predictive value of DCE MRI already in 2006 is very high. Multiparametric MRI, pirates classification one in this patient, absolutely normal. This is nothing. This is, this is not a focal lesion, did not show diffusion abnormalities. Nonetheless, this patient had a needle core biopsy which yielded less than 1%, 3 plus 3, and he heard two words. I have insignificant cancer, but he remembered the last word and he asked his urologist to perform a prostatectomy. Two tiny foci. Okay. We will miss insignificant cancer. That's the weakness, but also the strength of MRI. High negative predictive value. MR directed surgery. What would you do in this patient? Sexually active, PSA 9, Gleason 7. Sorry, this should be T2B. The urologist did feel something. And actually, he said, we have to sacrifice the neurovascular bundle. However, he was referred for an MRI first. And you can see the tumor is medial to the neurovascular bundle. So there was a surgeon who took the challenge and tried to sacrifice what, what, what succeeded to save the neurovascular bundle. This is image information which MR can provide. I leave it up to you whether you need it or not. This is diffusion, Gleason 7 component. Laser. These images I got from the same guy in the desert, so it's a not a university practice. There is a tumor here, Gleason 7. And this is what you see with MRI. You can see the needle guides, which we use for biopsy, a thin laser fiber with heat, and you can plot the temperature with MRI exactly. This is in a video of about two minutes, which we speed it up a bit. You can see the killing zone, and if you killed enough, you stop. This is the next step diffusion weighted imaging, and this is the result after the treatment. Work in progress. Okay, this is the overview of what I wanted to share with you. Um, how long will it take before radiologists are able to do the things which they need to do? It's up to them, it's up to you. I don't have a clear answer to the question, but I predict that it's pretty soon. Um, the world of radiology is changing towards the direction of prostate MR. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Dr. Barrett, for this very dynamic lecture. So, please, colleagues and friends, go ahead with the questions. It's the moment. You have an expert. Challenge him. Okay. Yes, please, Dr. Yunemann. Uh, it's interesting to see that you have the same problems that we have with the histoscopy, as you can see later on, because we cannot differentiate between prostatitis, ASAP or high-grade PIN, 
fibrosis or even cancer. That is, that is a problem. There might be ways of doing this. I will show that later on. But uh, how, do you, how would you or how will you overcome this problem? The question is, do I need to overcome? You have to be a little bit more precise. We do not see a difference between minimal Gleason 3 disease and prostatitis. We do see a difference between fibrosis and prostatitis. And, we of, uh, and of course, BPH and prostatitis is not a problem. So actually, the problem is we do not see a difference between minimal Gleason 3 and prostatitis. However, when there is a Gleason 4 component, which is significant, then you will pick it up with diffusion-weighted imaging. So we see a difference between significant cancer and prostatitis. So I'm, I'm not really sure whether we should solve the problem. Do we want to see every Gleason 3 plus 3 tumor with MRI? It's the same with breast. Do we want to see ductal carcinoma in situ? Should we solve the problem? And the question for me to you is, and unfortunately I have to leave because I have to catch a plane, is can you make a differentiation between Gleason 3 plus 3 and 3 plus 4 with histoscan? So can you separate the good from the bad guys and what's your negative predictive value, etc., etc.? Yeah, the first steps has been done and it seems to be possible and Mark yeah. button. Actually, yeah. he, he claims he can. I don't know. No, no I, I think there, well, histoscan is a very nice technique, and, and I've, I've seen already your results and of Zubarev mm -hmm. and of Mark, Mark Emerton's group. Um, it, it is good, but the real value, of course, needs to be proven, and what would be nice is to compare the two techniques. And we need to talk to the companies that they should enable a study doing that, because one on one, again, is three. Also, if you do a comparison like that, you can see which technique is not good and which technique is good. Thus far, there is enough evidence that MRI is there. If you, again, look at the paper of Schiara, European Urology MRI at this moment is there. And unfortunately, the proof with histoscan is not there yet. So I hope I answered your question. Quick question, Dr. Barrett, regarding uh, the cost of this screening intention with MRI. How do you face that, with politicians okay. especially? Okay, cost, cost. We always talk about cost. That's good. Um, it is possible if you want to do screening, potentially, not to give contrast agents. You want to see the bad guys. You don't want to see prostatitis, inflammation. You want to see the Gleason 4 tumors. Diffusion is the key plus anatomy. That will take about five to ten minutes of the MR examination. If we are developing, and currently we are developing, better surface coils which enable a better image quality, we can improve image quality and also we can decrease imaging time. It's my estimation that we will just have, like the mammogram, you have diagnostic mammograms and you have screening mammograms, we will have a screening MRI, which will take only 15 minutes. Now the net costs of an MRI machine in Europe, a three Tesla machine, um, including radiologists, etc., etc., is around 550 euros per hour. That means that potentially you have an examination which will be at the cost of 125 euros. That's becoming rather interesting. I also have been evaluating what would happen if we will continue in letting men in the Netherlands have the PSA being tested with the subsequent overdiagnosis, undergrading, too many biopsies. And if you add MRI and even MR guided biopsy, which is rather expensive because it takes more time, I estimate it roughly, but we'll do it better in detail, that the yearly cost saving is 30 million euros on a total budget of 100 million. That will increase. So actually MR can make healthcare cheap. Nobody believes it because, yeah, balance you, your MRI is 2 million euros. Well, your Da Vinci is also 2 million euros. <laughs> so MRI can make it cheap if you do it the right way. If you spend two hours on an MRI examination, forget about it. You need to be good, simple, and fast. I think we have ways to do that. Any more questions? Yes, yes. please, Marcus. Radiologist, should he buy a new machine? Does he need a new machine, or can he get the same results with 1.5 Tesla? It's a very good question. Uh, I think if he considers in buying a new machine, you should support him to his board of directors to buy a three Tesla machine. I, I'm not saying pay for it, but support him. 
MRI at three Tesla has a higher signal to noise, so your throughput, the number of patients you can do, is a lot higher. And if you work seven days per week, not 24 seven, but 10 hours per day, the, the, the cost of the machine is irrelevant. So that's, that's something else. Okay, now you, you have a radiologist and he, he, he's not able to buy a three Tesla machine. Then the question is, can he work with 1.5T? Yes, to some extent he can. He should be very careful about his image quality. The guidelines which we, are, uh, we have published are also on 1.5 Tesla. If he fulfills those guidelines, then you can do it. However, you should be careful not to confuse detection, localization, and aggression determination with staging. If you want to do staging with 1.5 Tesla, you certainly need always an endorectal coil, period. So he can do a good job. However, the examination will take a little bit longer, but he needs to spend more time. The more time you spend, the better the image quality is. So he could start. Yes. I have a practical question. Uh, how long do you wait with uh, MRI after biopsies? How long do you wait after biopsies? It's a very good question. If you want to do staging, so if you want to detect minimal capsular penetration, you should wait for three to four weeks because you may have hemorrhage. If you want to find a tumor which is not being detected by truss, you don't have to wait. Why? Because your blood is at the posterior part of the prostate and the tumor you're not finding is at the anterior part of the prostate. So we don't wait at all. We just do it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Klaas, yes. Also, the fusion-weighted imaging is not black in, in hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. It's gray. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have more of a philosophical question. There's a tremendous amount of research going on trying to identify a better biomarker to, uh, to predict aggressive cancer. And these are really two completely different approaches. There's not much communication between them. But I, I, if you, are you so confident in the value of this that if you were, say, uh, designing a research strategy, you would say, you know, there's no point really putting any further money into biomarker development because we are there with MRI. Okay, very good question. Um, never say no. Uh, of course, biomarkers will add a piece to the puzzle. The question is, how large is the piece of the puzzle? Um, at this moment, the piece of the puzzle of MRI is pretty big. And the piece of the puzzle of biomarkers is not that big. However, that can change in a few years. So I think research should continue in developing biomarkers. That's innovation. They need to be validated. But MRI at this moment is at the stage that we are already talking about implementation. And potentially it can be having a widespread implementation. If you look at the barriers of FDA and EMEA, of all kinds of molecular traces to be approved, we are far from there yet. So I think implementation with MRI is easy. It can be done in a simple way, so we should consider it. That doesn't mean that if you are offering me a trial to do PCA3 versus MRI, I will do it, or a new PCA3, yes? And if you have a new genetic marker in the blood, which just meant you can take some blood cells and you, you know exactly what your genomic profile is and whether you have an aggressive cancer, of course, that then will be a winner. And then the piece of that puzzle will be pretty big and the MRI is pretty small. But at this moment, the phenotype of MRI is so pretty strong that I think that with that already we can make an improvement. But we need to strive, of course, to the best result possible. I hope this is a little bit also a philosophical answer. Yes, please. The negative predictive value is quite impressive, but perhaps it's an insignificant cancer at the moment, and later on it becomes a significant cancer. Um, are there any suggestions from the data when to repeat the MRI lifelong? That's a very good question about uh, the development of a non-significant into a significant cancer. Well, the good thing is that with MRI, you're likely to see a, di a change in the, in, in the diffusion. It will, the restriction will be more marked. And the radiologist is good in one thing, compare the 10 results. We can compare images. So if you have a baseline image, you can compare. If the ADC goes down, you have to stick in a needle. Um, when do you need to repeat an MRI examination? I think that depends a little bit on the Clinical indication, and now I'm looking back at, at you, when you feel uncomfortable, hey guys, this is a patient, the MRI says no significant cancer, but hmm, I don't trust it, repeat the MRI. Uh, if I have a pyrus classification three, 
That means equivocal. If there is a low clinical suspicion, I say go home, be happy, come back next year. At least that's my advice to the urologist. Uh, if it's a high clinical suspicion, I will advise or I will stick in a needle myself. If it's a pyrats too, go home, be happy. However, you can always have a veto overrule my MRI because you're the clinician with most of the pieces of the puzzle. So I, th I think this again is communication. I'm, I'm not that much of afraid that we will miss a significant amount of tumors which will kill the patient because as soon as it is changing, if there is a change in cellular density, we can repeat it every year or every two years, you will be able to see it. One question on certification and uh, all the learning curve that we can talk for radiologists doing this business because as you know, at least in my area, there are many radiologists who provide us with MRIs of the prostate and we just need to redo them again with my own radiologist. Now, is there now, you have the guidelines out, but is there now a distinct way to get certified and to have that monitored for radiologists to know whether they are or not? No, we Because some not. patients are very deception. They come to me, I say, I'm sorry, this MRI has to be redone. They tell me, how is it possible that these radiologists can go and do these MRIs? That, that still is a problem. Um, if you have a bad quality examination, what you need to do is actually you as a urologist and a patient have access to the, the, the imaging examination, try to find within your area and we are, with the ESUR, we are going to make a map of reference centers in every country and the reference centers who are accredited by us, who we think are good, we can give you the name of such a center and that center is willing to review the examination of your radiologist and get, get, can give you a report or the radiologist, whatever you want. He says, hey guy, you're not fulfilling the requirements which are in the paper. Of course, we can't enforce anything, but you have the power of the, well, the top knowledge of the prostate MR group to say to your radiologist, you do a bad job. And also you can prove that he's doing a bad job because his results are not in concordance with what you find at prostatectomy or a biopsy. So be aggressive. Thank you very much. Perhaps one very last question, I think then after Dr. Barnes has to leave, unfortunately, yes. Yes, probably one technical question. Is there any software right now existing to help the radiologist to detect the cancer? Uh, yes, there is a software uh, available which helps to detect the radiologist to detect the cancer. The best software the radiologist had, in most radiologists have, is in, be in between their ears. That, that's their own mind. However, there are computers to help them to have a more structured report. Software is there by vendors. We are working on a software program ourselves, like other universities. Um, we are getting there. We, well, at least our center is trying to get the CE label because you need that. Also, we are working just like breast on computer-aided diagnosis. How can you make a average radiologist a good radiologist by just having a computer to say bloop, 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 bloop. At those points, you have to look the radiologist because there may be a tumor based on DCE and, and, and diffusion-weighted imaging. That's how it's going to happen. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>